I would like to thank again our speakers, uh, moderators, and attendees for their um, enthusiasm and attendance for the second day. Uh, thank you very much. And today we're going to have three sessions. Uh, the first session will be uh, moderated by colleagues and friends, Dr. Mervet Mahrous and Dr. Ahmed Rafai. Dr. Mervet is a consultant of adult medical oncology at Prince Sultan Medical City. And uh, Dr. Ahmed Rafai is a consultant of clinical oncology at uh, International Medical Center at Jeddah. Uh, the first session will be about HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. Um, Dr. Mervet and Dr. Ahmed, please. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nafisa, for the invitation and Dr. Elgarni for her holding this meeting uh, with uh, esteemed panel, uh, national and international uh, um, speakers. Um, today we'll start our uh, second day uh, and we'll start the first session and I'm happy to have uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad Rifai as could chair with me. We'll start first uh, our session uh, title, HER2 Positive Breast Cancer, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Rashad Al Khayat. Dr. Rashad Al Khayat is an associate professor of medicine and in College in King Abdulaziz University. He is a Canadian and American certified. Uh, worked previously as a professor at the uh, University of Western Ontario. Uh, Dr. Rashadi is very well known at name uh, on the national and the Middle East. He will give us a talk about escalated and escalated new adjuvant hormonal negative HER2 positive early breast cancer. Dr. Shadi, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Amirpur, for this uh, nice introduction. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for as a co-chairman. Uh, I'd like first to start uh, by thanking Dr. Nafisa and Dr. Muhammad al Garni for the arrangement of this uh, meeting and for the invitation. Uh, special thanks also to the organizing committee who has been, like you know, going through the technical uh, part and uh, making sure that we're getting uh, our uh, arrangement for this presentation. So over the next uh, 15 uh, minutes, I should be able to talk about like, you know, what we are doing now with the breast cancer, her to treatment in early setting as uh, a lot of changes has happened. So we know that the uh, her to treatment now is cancer, like, you know, despite there's a lot of change, uh, like, you know, improvement, still it uh, represents a challenge. Then we're gonna talk about the new adjuvant advances in the her to treatments. Uh, why we're doing this, so like, you know, have some highlighting about the uh, tumor response as a predictor for uh, response and also maybe for survival. And then we're going to come to the escalation versus de-escalation part in the treatment, where I believe it's a, it's a kind of a treatment that change that we do, uh, trying like not to protect the patient from some toxicity. So with that, I'll just start my presentation. So this is... Uh, uh, a slide here about the HER2 treatment. So we know like, you know, that HER2 treatment is a type of the, uh, one of the uh, types of the breast cancer, as we know, like, you know, there's a luminal A, luminal 2, sorry, luminal A, luminal B, and then we have the HER2 over expression disease, and then we have the triple negative breast cancer. Um, is there is like, you know, a cure for metastatic breast cancer? The answer is no. And like, you know, as aggressive we go in the first treatment, this is what's gonna hopefully uh, prevent going like, you know, to this stage of metastatic disease. So uh, the importance, and I would say the aggressiveness of treatment in early setting might like, you know, in prevent the, this problem from happening. Uh, we have too much of advances now in metastatic setting, yet the, uh, we need to avoid going there because at the end it's a chronic disease. There will be no cure once we reach the metastatic setting. So that's why, uh, like, you know, we go for cure and like, you know, cure, trying like, you know, to decrease the recurrences uh, of the cancer. So this is like, you know, where we see there has been like no significant improvement that we see like, you know, from a new adjuvant setting from adjuvant setting, like, you know, by adding additional treatment, there will be a survival advantage and like, you know, we minimize the risk of recurrence. The question how, like, you know, uh, in a harmony, how we can do that and which patient receive such additional treatment, because we know, like, you know, that any additional treatment, it carries uh, some uh, clinical risk, uh, even they are not uh, that significant risk, but still it's considered to be a risk. Also, like, you know, we need to look from uh, the side of financial toxicity to institution and to budget 
what to do with these treatments and that's the uh, importance about escalation and de-escalation uh, discussion. So we know that for treating breast cancer patients, now we have a lot of treatment that comes in the early setting. We have the pertuzumab plus trastuzumab, which is kind of like, you know, a combination that has been used in the new adjuvant and adjuvant setting. Uh, we have the Herceptin, uh, sorry, the Paclitaxel plus the trastuzumab as an adjuvant setting in like, you know, small tumor disease. And this is like, you know, if you see here, the approval from uh, different like, you know, authority uh, uh, regulatories. We have the TDM1, which came like, you know, to the uh, map uh, after the Catherine trials and also like, you know, from a small uh, initial trials and adjuvant setting. And then we have Neratinib uh, as kind of like, you know, extended treatment for HER2 disease. The question, which of, which of these patients need like, you know, to use all the medications and which will use like, you know, a specific protocol. That's why we have a different protocol uh, to be discussed with patients all the time. Uh, we know that uh, each physician would have like, you know, a specific criteria and specific protocol. Like, you know, some of us, we use the AC plus the, uh, followed by Paclitaxel and Herceptin. Some use like, you know, Docetaxel, Carboplatin with the combined treatment. But again, at the end, like, you know, we have a general concepts that we believe in according to the size of the tumor, according like, you know, to the lymph node status and the residual part of the disease, then the decision will be built on the uh, treatment uh, that we have. So this is the, uh, like, you know, what the combination we use an anti her 2 treatment, but the question which one to use, like, you know, uh, all the medications. So in the new adjuvant setting, the main reasons why we use this and uh, like, you know, we have like, you know, to get an earlier control because theoretically, as we treat the cancer cells, we have like, you know, a better control of the disease. And then uh, we have, we can have an assessment because like, you know, we, uh, when we treat the patients with the new adjuvant treatments, we have a better assessment on the uh, control on the cells uh, to see like, you know, how much we're able to kill of these cancer cells which we know uh, will kill if there is any, uh, like, you know, this type metastases. And then this is like, you know, a testing for the in vitro uh, response of the cells and how much of this uh, will be um, responding. Because if we have some resistant cells, we might like, you know, upgrade the protocol or change the protocol to a different combination uh, trying or allowing for more killing of these cancer cells. Um, we know that when we started to treat the uh, new adjuvant treatment in the heart, in the breast cancer, there's like, you know, patients that were using like a you know, large tumor, multiple lymph nodes, but HER2 disease per se is considered to be a specific disease uh, where new adjuvant treatment has shown like, you know, if used an earlier, would have a more uh, complete response and that will uh, be a surrogate for uh, improving uh, survival in these patients. So the ENOA trial is like, you know, the first trial I showed like, you know, the new adjuvant treatment and there was a difference like, you know, uh, in the, uh, when they added the Herceptin to the chemotherapy that the pathological response has improved from 19%, almost doubled to 38%. So this is kind of like, you know, how we uh, clearly showed uh, the doubling the, or the complete pathological response based on using the treatment. And that has established like, you know, using the anti-HER2 treatment uh, in the uh, new adjuvant setting, uh, regardless what the protocol here, but like, you know, they joined the, uh, the key part here, like, you know, the taxane uh, to, the, uh, Hercept to the Herceptin, and that's what led to that improvement. So we know that from the uh, new sphere, there's like, you know, also was an improvement when they used the uh, doublet uh, anti-HER2 treatment of pertuzumab and trastuzumab, compared to trastuzumab alone, there was like, you know, an also an almost doubling of the complete pathological response. So like, you know, we had like, you know, if you consider here, there's a third arm here, if you compare the NOAA to the, uh, uh, to the new sphere, there was like, you know, an arm here where like, you know, complete response, despite they have a different trait, but like, you know, it was 50% improvement with adding the Herceptin and then another like, you know, doubling of the pathological response by adding the pertuzumab. Whether like, you know, we can compare the trials or not, this is something different. It's for kind of a different discussion, yet we can see an improvement by adding uh, double anti uh, HER2 treatments uh, to this protocol. And I believe that has been established as a standard of care where all centers, they have the uh, pertuzumab, they have been using the uh, dual uh, HER2 treatments in the new adjuvant setting. So we see clearly here how much like, you know, we had a separation in the curve suggesting like, you know, an improvement in the progression of free survival in the new sphere. 
in the trephenia, so like, you know, also we see an improvement in the, uh, so this kind of like, you no know, different protocol, we see that the PCR has improved, like, you know, I was using the uh, dual treatment. And again, like, you know, we see an improvement in the disease-free survival. So multiple uh, studies has shown, like, you know, adding the anti-HER2 treatment, uh, either a single uh, agent or the dual agents, as what we're doing right now, has improved the uh, complete pathological response. So I think this is uh, where the practice has moved right now. This is like, you know, the PCR in the multiple trials. So like, you know, there's a smaller trials apart from these. And we see here, this is like, you know, in the HANA trial and then our trial where they use only Herceptin as an agent and then starting from the new sphere all the way, like, you know, there is using the combination of the, uh, uh, of the double HER2 treatment. So like, you know, we see like, you know, a significant improvements where we see our survival, uh, sorry, a complete pathological response uh, like, you know, in the 60s and uh, to know in a clinical practice, but like, you know, I believe uh, since we change our practice in our hospital, we see, we have been seeing much more patients uh, that they would have reached to have complete pathological response. So almost like, you know, a change in the practice since the new sphere entrophina has came to the uh, practice, uh, like, you know, to the, uh, to be published that uh, in centers where the medications available, we have been using the combination uh, treatment in New Adjuvant City. Whether the AG, like, you know, so this is like, you know, the impact of pathological response and looking like, you know, for outcome. So this is like, you know, trying to discuss here uh, the uh, progression, the event free survival. So we see in patients who had a complete pathological response, they have a better complete survival compared to patients who had still residual disease. Um, and this is kind of like, you know, the outcomes here. So the event rate, you see like, you know, patient who achieve a response from the different trials, they have a better uh, like, you know, uh, progression or developing an event in the uh, future. So why we have residual disease, and I think this is will be, uh, I think partly this is in it. And I think the, again, like, you know, we have the heterogeneity of the, uh, of the tumor cells. So we have like, you know, we have multiple cells there. They would be most probably all of them are hard to uh, overexpressing, but then at the end, like, you know, we have cells that they're sensitive, but, and we have partially or pre-existing, like, you know, resistant cell. And I believe that's the reason why we, when we upgrade it or use a dual anti her 2 treatment, we'll be able like, you know, uh, to kill some of these uh, resistant cell uh, till we improve the complete pathological response. So I believe that this is, why we had an improvement in the dual anti her 2 treatment. So maybe the Herceptin alone will be able to kill all the sensitive cells, but I think the anti her 2 will be able to kill more of these cells. The question is, there's any other mechanism that we can use to kill the remaining uh, resistant cells by using another uh, medication that can have a different effect on the, uh, of anti, of the HER2 overexpressing cells. And I guess that's where the Catherine trials came like you know, to have that question. So in an algorithm for the treble, like, you know, for HER2 uh, overexpressing disease, uh, this is kind of like, you know, the most widely accepted criteria that tumors that not positive or more than two centimeter, uh, if the, the question like, you know, uh, if they go to the uh, new adjuvant treatments here, then like, you know, they have a surgery, if they have complete pathological response, whether we want to deescalate to only using the Herceptin or like, you know, using the Herceptin plus pertuzumab, or like, you know, still they have a residual disease using the TDM1 as per the Catherine trial. And I think that's where the uh, escalation comes and the escalation here. So why we use an escalation, we'd like to overcome the resistant clone as we showed in the previous um, like, you know, diagram to improve the outcome. So as much we have a better pathological response, this will uh, lead to a better outcome and less events of uh, recurrence high risk population because still we have patients who comes with the uh, T4 disease or like, you know, multiple lymph nodes. So I think this is a population where we think about escalation. Descalation, I believe like, you know, this is for certain very low risk disease and like, you know, also trying to minimize the toxicity, whether financial or clinical toxicity, that's where we need to discuss. And this is like, you know, could include either using the chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy choice, because we know that we have a specific Small trials has published about a single agent like you know, paclitaxel on a weekly, uh, the, on a weekly basis, or using an anti-HER2 therapy, uh, like you know, using a single agent or double agent. And I believe that the new future would be for using the, um, like you know, the uh, immunotherapy as part of the treatment. Where I believe we're going to talk about that. So now in adjuvant sitting, like you know, we have been uh, used. We have an approval for using neratinib, and this is kind of like you know, for extent for the extended use 
after finishing their septum and that has like you know has a pros and cons whether to be used in everyone or not the combined treatment of trastuzumab pertuzumab as per affinity trial or like you know the new adjuvant setting it into continuation affinity trial or using the tdm as per the catherine uh, trial where i believe it's the uh Established a new standard of care. So quickly, this is the affinity, whether we agree or not for all population. So this is like you know, for all population. Yet I'm just bringing here the analysis where the high risk group, so hormone negative patients where they have a, like you know more statistically significant, and also in the node positive disease where they have more statistically significant. Uh, I know there's a lot of statistical debates about the affinity trial. Uh, in all population, but in at least for my simple opinion, and I believe a lot of uh, discussions came about that, that patient who had an early a node positive disease or patients who had um, the uh, no, a hormone negative disease, this might be a population where they get more survival advantage by using uh, the dual uh, blockade as a continuation in adjuvant setting compared to a uh, single agent uh, trastuzumab. Uh, the uh, this is the neuratinib. So this is uh, like you know, clearly patient who had the treatment. They get extended treatment by neuratinib compared to the placebo. With keeping in mind that they got like you know some toxicity, mainly about the fatigue and the diarrhea. So if you keep that in your mind, but there was like you know improvement in the whole population of like you know almost two percent uh, in survival. But then the survival was a little bit like you know much more in patients. Uh, uh, like we've seen the hormone positive, hormone negative, we see a specific uh, better, like, you know, improvement. That's where we need to believe. So in a new adjuvant setting, like, you know, that's, I believe, where we need to focus. And uh, I guess we, in, in centers where they don't have, like, you know, engagement by the surgeons, I believe we need to discuss this and this, because in a smaller centers, you can see patients who proceed directly to surgery, which I believe uh, make the patient lose the opportunity of using the new adjuvant setting. This is the Catherine trial for patients who had the residual disease, and I believe this is a standard of care, and it was a big milestone, just trying to overcome those resistant cells. Like, you know, they found patients who did not uh, develop complete pathological response. Then when we switched to the, uh, using the anti, uh, the TDM1, we have like, you know, a specific improvement in the recurrence uh, free survival. So this is uh, like, you know, uh, I, th I think again, like, you know, centers where TDM is available, this has established like, you know, a new um, standard of care for these population to be utilized uh, for these resistant cell. So that's like, you know, just quickly about that. Can we de-escalate the zero surgery so we don't do the surgery? And I believe like, you know, there is a clinical trial and is running right now to see if we can avoid surgery in this population. I believe this is, will be very interesting. And uh, because patients all the time, they start to discuss with us in the clinic that doctor, can I avoid doing the surgery? And once we have these studies uh, or like, you know, the early data, even with this, we might be able like, you know, to give some hints for the patient, but until to change the practice to say no surgery, I think that will be quite difficult. It's not coming at least in the next five years. Uh, we'll need to have longer time with that. So the Catherine, I said, like, you know, establish a new standard of care. So I think like, you know, patient who had the residual disease as a, pra as a practice right now, they should be receiving the TD in one once the medication is available. I know there's some change challenges in some of the centers that TDM is not available. And I believe if if such case, we need to refer the patients to centers where it's not available. So this is kind of like, you know, as before the Catherine, like, you know, patients to continue on the double blockade, whether they use of me adjuvant or not. But then after Catherine, now we have this protocol where patient, they go to the TDM1. So they're going to receive the same number of the, uh, of the cycles, yet the change from the dual blockade of pertuzumab perceptin going to TDM1. Uh, we know that TDM1 slightly have more side effects than the combined anti HER2 treatment. So uh, this is need to be taken in consideration. Uh, but like, you know, with that improvement in the uh, events, uh, in the, sorry, in disease-free survival, I think it's worth like, you know, to establish that to all centers. Uh, and I think we need to consider that. So this is like, you know, where I was talking about like, you know, the immune cells. So like, you know, I think Dr. Said is gonna be elaborating on the molecular signature of the HER2 treatment. But uh, I think like, you know, we see now significant improvement in the triple negative breast cancer with the using immunotherapy. Uh, whether like, you know, we have a specific marker of that, they're using the PDL one uh, right now, uh, PD1 receptor uh, assessment. So if we have like, you know, in certain trials more than one, initially it was more than 10. Uh, the score, and then like, you know, the benefit from immunotherapy, but like, you know, we're talking about these resistant clones, uh, like, you know, that in the heterogeneity of the cells. So I think like, you know, whether using that, 
So this study, like you know, was doing like you know now we're talking about using the anti uh, the immunotherapy in the new adjuvant setting and whether this is will improve the toxicity as it will improve the uh, complete response or not. I think we have good number of studies like you know they're going to be coming in the pipeline to see whether we have that benefit. And I believe they're going to be positive because these resistant cells, they have, uh, uh, they demonstrate different characteristics from the uh, normal cells and they're more aggressive. And hopefully, if they can, uh, using the immune therapy to trigger a response, again, it's these cells that will uh, kill the uh, cells that are responsible about development of metastasis at the resistance. So we have three clinical trials that are ongoing right now. Hopefully, we're going to see, like, you know, these results maybe by 20. 2023 by the end of that year we should be able to see the result of the uh, PCR so where to go uh, as I'd like you know for this early breast cancer I think like you know now the uh, reducing the burden of the cells that the very important and uh, in certain patients as we said earlier in specific population where they have a very small population of the cancer cells so small load of tumors they are HER2 positive I think this is where we uh, come to treatment uh, this, I think, we have two minutes. Two uh, minutes, Dr. Shadi, yes. please. Yes, Dr. Amr. So, in, we see, like, you know, we have two studies where it's about, like, you know, a simple protocol for these patients. So, the APT study has been shown, like, you know, in this population where, like, you know, it's a kind of a, of a mechanism of de escalation, but, like, you know, specific population where they have a villarose disease or they're elderly patients. So, the APT protocol came to be, like, you know, as one of the opportunity. And we know like, you know, the reason why we use the APT and then uh, the trials here that this population, like, you know, uh, when they used it, they have a, like, you know, it's a less toxicity for these patients. So that's like, you know, which is the most important uh, part. Keeping in mind that this is the use of Bactaxel here in a phase two. So we don't have a phase three in uh, like, you know, in this study, uh, but like, you know, it's more logic because they have already a very small tumor with the lowest feature. So that will be uh, applicable. And then we have that TIM trial. So again, like, you know, it's a phase two trial where instead of using like, you know, the chemotherapy, uh, like you know, it was said again, it's like, you know, using the weekly back attack and TDM1 uh, showed like, you know, they have a uh, non-inferior uh, effect. So is this kind of a, a mechanism of, of de-escalation? I believe it's, is it a substitute for the uh, specific population we might discuss it, keeping it in mind that this is only a phase two trial. I believe we're doing it already in the clinic in patients who are avoid a lot of toxicity. They have a very small tumor or their elderly patient. We have been using this as a mechanism uh, of trying to uh, improve the patient satisfaction without like, you know, affecting the prognosis. But we need to keep in mind that phase two uh, studies are not done like, you know, to change the uh, practice that we're doing uh, on a daily uh, basis. So. My summary for that, like, you know, this is the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, this is the HER2 treatments now. Uh, it's had a very uh, high risk disease. So like, you know, adding a more aggressive treatment to new adjuvant setting, that will be improving, uh, hopefully, the survival by decreasing recurrence going through the journey of the breast cancer metastases. Dual treatment, I think, to improve the PCR, and that has been consistent in multiple trials. The Catherine study has established a new standard of care right now in those population. I think this is very important, uh, like, you know, uh, big milestones in treating her to uh, patients, especially in centers where they use aggressively new adjuvant treatment. Immunotherapy, I've, this is kind of like, you know, a future, uh, like, you know, like, you know, line for these patients trying, like, you know, to enhance the effect, keeping in mind still, like, you know, that immunotherapy has been utilized mainly in the uh, uh, metastatic settings. So we don't know about the long-term side effects of these, especially when we use it in a younger patient. And I believe that's one of the discussion in the triple negative breast cancer whether using immunotherapy early will be an important uh, uh, benefit maybe to improve the response uh, and the PCR, but maybe long-term toxicity that we're not quite sure about it because we don't have enough specific toxicity. So all the time, think about like, you know, when we have the opportunities to de-escalate, like, you know, using a weekly baclitaxel uh, plus uh, trastuzumab or using the TDM alone, but again, keeping in mind only phase two study. And then think about the sub-Q formulation. I think this is, has shown a significant, like, you know, patient satisfaction, especially in center where they heavily has been using the subcutaneous formulation. And I believe that this is my last uh, slide. And I would uh, like to thank you all. And back to you, Mr. Chairman and Co-Chairman. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shadi. It was excellent uh, presentation. I will hand the mic to uh, Dr. Ahmad Rifai. Dr. Ahmad, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amirwat, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for their effort to make this uh, uh, nice uh, meeting. And after we just uh, heard Dr. Uh, Shadi for his, this is very nice uh, presentation, we will just go to uh, our uh, dear uh, colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Turki. Dr. Abdullah Turki is the head of the Medical Oncology Department and the Comprehensive Cancer Center in King Fahd uh, Medical uh, City. And Dr. Uh, Abdullah will speak about the uh, using Trastuzumab plus endocrine therapy or chemotherapy as a first line treatment for patient with metastatic triple positive uh, uh, breast uh, cancer. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, uh, the mic is yours, uh, please. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for your nice introduction. And um, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, the organizing committee, for being part of such activity. So the title of um, that I have received, as you can see, is a bit long. But um, in a simple word, um, today I will try to go over um, the role of endocrine therapy with um, anti hir 2 uh, as a first line for metastatic uh, triple positive uh, uh, breast cancer. <clears throat> so um, uh, this abstract fact, a uh, fish one just uh, presented at ASCO this year. Uh, it was a randomized uh, phase three trial of uh, chemo-based anti-HER2 versus uh, endocrine uh, based anti her 2 and as you can see, um, uh, both uh, BFS and uh, overall survival are look uh, the same. Uh, at the first impression, you, you might say it's uh, if the chemo-based and endocrine-based look the same, why I have to push for um, uh, chemo in those patients, um, knowing the fact that this uh, is more kind of palliative treatment. Um, but if you think 